Hi, this is Dr. Rob Silas again. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. So, what does that mean? Why am I the Carb Addiction Doc? Why do I call that, use that name for myself? And this and the next podcast are going to explain that. So, let's go back to our human biology model. In order to understand how different foods affect us, we have to understand what the needs and how the human body works. Instead of talking about food and weight and obesity and all those kind of things, let me use a brief analogy. If you drink water, how much water do you really need to drink? The reality is you have no idea, number one, and number two is you really don't need to know. Why don't you need to know? Because your body is damn good at figuring that out for itself. So when you're thirsty, you start to drink water. You have no idea how much you're going to drink. Might be one glass, two glasses, two and a half glasses. I don't care. And at some point, as you're thirsty and you're drinking, your body, through a variety of biochemical signals, sends a message back to your brain that says, stop. You're full. You've had enough water. Your thirst is quenched. And there's no incentive to overdrink. Could you overdrink a little bit? Sure. But there's no incentive to do it. and We don't do it. So therefore, nobody drinks water to excess. And that's, by the way, part of the lunacy of people telling you you have to drink so much water. That is, and I'm going to use a medical word here, that's absolute bullshit. Your body knows what to do. How does the body know what to do? Well, here's an important biological lesson. It's called homeostasis. What homeostasis means is this. For everything that is essential to the human body, every function, every system, everything that is essential to human function, that is without which the body will get sick and die, the body controls biologically in what's called a feedback pathway. So you've got an action and an equal and opposite reaction. So when I'm thirsty, I drink with a powerful incentive and my thirst is quenched, a signal goes back to my brain that says you've had enough and you stop. Think about your car. You've got a gas pedal and you've got a brake. They work equal and opposite, but they drive the car. One makes it go, one makes it stop. Think about not having either one. If one's missing, your car doesn't work properly. And the same thing with the human body. Now, at the same time, when something is not essential to the human body, it typically doesn't have feedback control. Okay, so let's use an example of that. Water, tightly controlled. Alcohol, not so much. We have to drink water for nutrition, for hydration. Nobody drinks alcohol for hydration. We drink alcohol for pleasure. Yes, it's a powerful, powerful activator of the endorphin system. It makes us feel great. But alcohol is not necessary for human consumption. And therefore, there is no feedback control. Passing out isn't feedback control. That's toxicity. Okay, so therefore, when we drink alcohol, excess is possible because there's no stopping point. And as most people know, when you drink alcohol to excess over time, it causes harm. You get DUIs, you get liver disease, you lose your job, your family, that's the harm. And if you ignore or distort the reality of the harm because of the pleasure you derive from that alcohol, over time, you lose control of the relationship. You're an alcoholic. Everybody understands that. That's obvious. We've worked that out as human beings. The other very smart thing that we've done is we know as human beings we cannot control our consumption of alcohol. So we've created a mathematical formula that we teach people, that we instruct people about to be able to quantify how much alcohol is okay to drink. And it's based on the ounces of alcohol per drink and the numbers of drinks. So I know I can drink three or four beers and be safe. I know I can drink two or three glasses of wine and be safe. I know I can drink two or three cocktails and be safe. But that is a conscious decision that I have to make with my brain because there is no feedback. I never have to do the same with water. However, the other piece is this, that if I decide I'm going to supersede those limits with alcohol, I sure, sure can. I've done that experiment a few times, uh, uh, purely for, for medical reasons, never for pleasure reasons, of course. But you can't do the same with water. So if I decide tonight to drink 12 bottles of beer, absolutely I can. Again, I've done that experiment. But there's no way in the same amount of time I can drink 12 bottles of water. My body won't let me. That is homeostasis. 
Now, let's take that obvious example that everybody can understand and apply it to obesity. And this is critical to understand why we become fat. First statement, it is absolutely impossible to become fat from eating food. Food, by definition, are the substances that we have to consume because without them, as human beings, we get sick and we die. They are nutrients, and they may be certain minerals, certain vitamins, certain trace elements, but they also include two very important sources of calories, fat and protein. Without certain essential fatty acids, without certain essential amino acids, we will get sick and die. Most people understand that. And when it comes to food, we have very, very tight feedback control that's mediated by the stretch receptors in our stomach and by certain chemical hormone processes. The most important hormonal process called the leptinoids, there's actually about five of them that we know of right now, possibly even some more, peptide YY, cholecystokinin, a few others that are in the gastrointestinal tract and leptin from the fat cells that work together to stop us from eating an excess amount of food. And the primary trigger for that is fat. Fat is unique in that when you eat fat, it gets absorbed, not in the bloodstream that goes to the liver, but when fat gets absorbed from the intestine, most of it gets trapped in a, a bile, like a little soap bubble called, called bile salts. And that enters the intestine and enters the lymphatic system, not the blood system. And the lymphatic system collects up and goes through a big channel um, and it goes up into the neck and it deposits directly into the blood vessel system. So instead of going through the liver, it goes up through the single channel in the left neck and goes straight to the fat cells and straight to the other cells. Yes, some of it does go to the liver, but most of it goes to the fat cells. And as the fat cells pick that up, that fat up, they put out this hormone called leptin. Now remember, there's been hormones released all the way through the intestinal tract as you've eaten that fat, and that leptin sends a powerful signal to the brain. You kind of feel queasy, you feel a bit miserable before you've eaten a huge amount. I'm full, I'm full. So let's look at this. If you're really hungry, I'm assuming you uh, are, not, are okay eating meat, and I put a big ribeye steak in front of you. Let's say I put 80 ounces of ribeye steak, nice, big, fat, juicy ribeye steak in front of you, or maybe five roast chickens, or a piece of salmon this big, it doesn't much matter. You're hungry, so you start to eat. You have no idea how much you're gonna eat. I have no idea how much ribeye I'm gonna eat. It might be six ounces, it might be 20 ounces. It doesn't matter. Here's why it doesn't matter. Because at some point as I'm eating, even though I'm hungry, my body will push back and say, dude, you're full, I'm stuffed, I've had enough. That chemical response from fat, that distension from the food in my stomach says, dude, you're full and you stop. And no matter how free and how tasty that ribeye steak is, you can't eat more. You cannot eat more. I'm full. But two minutes later, what are we doing? We're eating dessert. It's the ice cream with a cheesecake. Or we're sitting in front of the TV with a bag of chips or a bag of uh, M&Ms or some pretzels. Is that food? Are we eating food? Are we eating for the nutritional value what's in front of us? Hell no, we're not. And this is such an important concept to understand. Remember when I listed the things that are biologically essential to humans in terms of nutrients, there was one critical thing that was not on that list. The thing that's not on that list is carbohydrates, sugar and starch. And remember, sugar and starch are the same thing. Starch is just a chain of sugar. And together they form this thing called carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are nutritionally not essential to be consumed. And the reason for that, very simply, is the liver is extremely good at manufacturing sugar, glucose and carbohydrates from protein and fatty acids. In fact, the glycerol of fatty acids. So the liver produces sugar, even though we have to have sugar in our bloodstream, it doesn't have to come from our face. So therefore, carbohydrates are not essential in the human diet. And because they're not essential, there is no feedback control. There is no feedback control. 
So therefore, we can eat way more carbohydrates than we can possibly eat real food. You cannot become fat from eating real food. But carbohydrates, you can eat to excess. And when you eat them to excess repetitively, harm happens. You become fat and sick. And I'll explain later on how you become fat and sick. But right now, what you've got to understand is that it's impossible to get fat from eating food. Sure, if you reduce your calorie consumption, you lose weight. But you don't become fat because you eat food. You exclusively become fat because of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. It is purely sugar and starch in any form because it doesn't matter how it goes in your face. It is sugar and starch that enters your bloodstream in excessive quantities beyond a point when you're full or repetitively throughout the day as a snack that in incrementally leads to obesity and overwhelms the insulin control resulting in disease. That's how we become fat and sick. Exclusively carbohydrates, not food. And once you understand that concept, then the next part and then the next podcast I'm going to present will be, okay, why? Why do we eat carbohydrates to excess? Wait for that one in a little bit. There's one other concept that I want, to understand, I want you to understand because we human beings are very smart. And just like with alcohol, because we know we can't control our relationship with alcohol, we quantified how much it's okay to drink on a mathematical formula called ounces of alcohol and numbers of drinks. We did exactly the same thing when it came to what we eat. It is because of carbohydrates and our limitless ability to consume them that we smart human beings said, okay, we have to develop a mathematical formula to quantify how much it's safe and okay to eat without becoming fat and sick. And we created a mathematical system that is based on something called thermodynamics, how much energy is required to raise the body temperature by one degree Fahrenheit or to produce one degree of Fahrenheit extra in heat. And we call that calories. And we use calories to measure, to quantify how much broadly it is safe to consume products that are not vital to human survival and that are not naturally controlled by the human body. So calories specifically apply to carbohydrates, but then we broadened it to all categories of food. You see, when it comes to eating fat and protein, my body controls that. I never have to quantify how much, either in terms of calories or portions, I need to eat. I can eat until I'm full every time, and my body will control that, and it won't make me fat and sick. But when it comes to carbohydrates, because there is no control, we need to use a mathematical formula to define how much. And that's based on calories. And we've kind of done all these mathematical gymnastics. I'm a gymnastics. I'm not a mathematician. But we've defined kind of how much it's okay to eat. And it might be 1,600 calories. It might be 2,000 calories. Who knows what the truth is in that? But that's kind of the pseudo formula that we've used. And we use that formula to define the portion sizes. And therefore, the amount we dish up, and as human beings, we're designed, or, or we're not designed, but we become educated not designed, educated, to have a certain a portion of food and that becomes how much we think is okay to eat. But that's a totally fictitious, arbitrary measurement system, calories and portions, because we're eating crap that the human body doesn't need biologically. If you don't eat carbohydrates, calories and portion sizes become irrelevant. If you don't eat car carbohydrates, calories and portion sizes become irrelevant, you return to a biologic form of eating and the human body will control how much you eat. And that's the basis of a ketogenic diet, allowing the body to stop you when you're full and you don't overeat, as long as you don't eat carbohydrates. When you bring carbohydrates in, all of that goes out the window. So carbohydrates fall in the same category as alcohol, and once you understand that, you can then define for yourself a better, healthier, biologic way to eat. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please click the subscribe button and become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. 
And if that message resonated with you and made you think, and you made the decision to do more to help yourself, but you need help, please come and see us. Set up a consultation. We can do it in person in my offices in Palm Beach Gardens at 561-627-4107 or in Jacksonville, Florida at 904-410-3934. I also do some long-distance consults telephonically or on Zoom. Set that up as well by calling 561-627-4107. We help people to manage their diabetes better and also to get started in obesity management. Or if you've had bariatric or obesity surgery and are struggling, give us a shout. We can help to get you back on track.